With the ever-present debate about abortion through the various headline cycles throughout the year, you may have heard or stumbled across pro-abortion arguments making claims of a biblically approved abortion with instructions of how to perform one in the book of Numbers. The particular passage is found in Numbers 5, detailing what's referred to as the ordeal of bitter water, which was a ritual wherein, if a husband suspected his wife of adultery, he would take her to the priest, after the appropriate prayers and sacrifices, and the woman swearing her innocence, she would then drink a concoction, the said bitter water. If she had lain with a man aside from her husband, her body would rot and she would be a curse to the people. But if she hadn't been unfaithful, she would conceive a child. So what exactly is happening in this passage? Is it really an example of a biblically approved and priest-guided abortion? Well, let's first look at the text itself. I'll read the entirety of the Test of Adultery, which covers Numbers 5, 11 through 31. I'll read from the King James Version, but we'll make note of other translations afterwards. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, and she be defiled, and there be no witnesses against her, neither she be taken with the manner, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled, or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she not be defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part and an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of a memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. And the priest shall bring her near, and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle the priest shall take, and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord, and uncover the woman's head, and put the offering of memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man have lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man hath lain with thee besides thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels, to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her, and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, and shall wave the offering before the Lord, and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterward shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that, if she be defiled, and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter into her, and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free, and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies, when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband, and is defiled. For when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law, then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. So what's all happening here? Let's go through the passage step by step. Firstly, the test of adultery is when a husband suspects his wife has been unfaithful without any proof. And that's a major component to this. The man has no proof of his wife's infidelity. 
No one saw her with another man, and neither did the husband see any physical signs of adultery, which would also preclude finding her pregnant. The man is overcome with the spirit of jealousy and takes her to the priest thusly. The offerings are then made, and the woman is put under oath as she stands before God. This is important as, if she did commit adultery, she begins the trial with a lie before God. We see the seriousness of this in the Acts of the Apostles when Ananias and Sapphira held back a portion of the land sold, and lied about how much they sold it for, and they were both struck dead. The priest explains the curse to the woman. Then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord shall make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that caused the curse shall go into thy bowels, to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And in her saying, Amen, Amen, she is agreeing to the consequences. So be it, so be it, or let it be done, let it be done. Now let's look at the actual concoction that the woman is made to drink. Some modern pro-abortion advocates have called it an aborticide. But what is it exactly? The makeup of the bitter water is holy water from an earthen vessel and dust from the floor of the tabernacle. The priest would then take the book in which the curses were written and wipe the ink off into the water of conviction, and then the ink, water, and dust would be mixed together. The priest would then take the grain offering, burn it on the altar, and then have the woman drink. Now aside from a bitter taste, true to its name of bitter water, there is nothing in the makeup that would induce an abortion. Aborticides were in fact known to the ancient world, pharmaceuticals that would induce a miscarriage. The 21st canon of the Council of Ancrea, circa 314 AD, specifies, concerning women who commit fornication and destroy that which they have conceived, or who are employed in making drugs for abortion, a former decree excluded them until the hour of death. And to this some have assented. Nevertheless, being desirous to use somewhat greater leniency, we have ordained that they fulfill ten years of penance, according to the prescribed degrees. The first century Jewish historian Josephus, in his work against Apion, states, The law, moreover, enjoins us to bring up all our offspring, and forbids women to cause abortion of what is begotten, or to destroy it afterward. And if any woman appears to have done so, she will be a murderer of her child, by destroying a living creature and diminishing humankind. So far from the bitter water being a cause for an abortion, it is just the medium through which the curse of God acts. We see this most evidently in the tradition of the birth of Christ recalled in the Proto-Evangelion of James, in which, after Mary is found with a child, both she and Joseph are brought before the temple, accused of breaking their vows, Joseph accused of defiling the virgin he swore to protect, and Mary accused of breaking her vow of chastity. Both the Virgin Mary and Joseph the betrothed drink the bitter water before the priests of the temple, and neither receive ill effects, showing their innocence. If the drink were to cause a miscarriage, there would be no reason for Joseph to have drank it along with Mary. And what of the curse itself? This seems to be the most important question when it comes to the idea of an induced miscarriage. The King James verse 27 is again, And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that, if she be defiled, and having done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her, and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. The Septuagint Greek reads as, And it shall come to pass, if she be defiled, and have altogether escaped the notice of her husband, then the water of the conviction that brings the curse shall enter into her, and she shall swell in her belly, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be for a curse in the midst of her people. The curse itself would be a very painful death, with the body of the woman rotting away, or at the very least rendering her infertile. So where does the idea of a miscarriage come from? It comes from a single translation of the New International Version from 2011. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and cause bitter suffering, it will enter into her. Her abdomen will swell and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. It is important to remember what the penalty for adultery was in the Old Testament times. As we see in the Gospel lesson of the woman caught in adultery about to be stoned, adultery was punished by death. As there were no witnesses, only a spirit of jealousy falling upon the husband, God instead would inflict the punishment instead of the people. 
Josephus writes in his Antiquity of the Jews, Book 3, Chapter 11, Section 6, But if she had broken her faith of wedlock to her husband, and had sworn falsely before God, she died in a reproachful manner, her thigh fell off from her, and her belly swelled with a dropsy. Neither the original Greek nor the Hebrew, as testified by Josephus, speak anything about any sort of miscarriage. And while belly and womb are often used interchangeably, if we were to assume the text is referencing womb instead of belly, that by no means implies pregnancy, as that is also the part of the body where the sexual infidelity took place. The curse entering the belly or womb, and the belly swelling and the thigh rotting, would be appropriate for the crime. The New International Version creates its own interpretation of the text, which no other translation suggests. In fact, even so, it changes the punishment from the death of the woman to forcing an abortion. Taking into account Old Testament law of both adultery and speaking falsehood to God results in death. It completely changes the punishment of two sins, which both lead to death, to something God's law has never condoned. What about the mention of conceiving if found innocent? That again shows that the woman in question is not with child already, as she will then conceive as a reward for her innocence. The reason why this is specifically mentioned is because having a child was seen as a very great blessing from God. In Psalm 126 we read, Lo, sons are the heritage of the Lord, the reward of the fruit of the womb. Like arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so were the sons of them that were outcasts. Blessed is he that shall fulfill his desires with them. They shall not be put to shame when they speak to their enemies in the gates. And on the contrary, if a couple was unable to bear a child, they were seen as cursed by God. Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Virgin Mary, had long been unable to conceive a child to the point of despondency. As we read in the Proto-Evangelion of James, In the records of the twelve tribes of Israel was Joachim, a man rich exceedingly, and he brought his offerings double, saying, There shall be of my superabundance to all the people, and there shall be the offering for my forgiveness to the Lord for a propitiation for us. For the great day of the Lord was at hand, and the sons of Israel were bringing their offerings. And there stood over against him Reuben, saying, It is not meet for you to bring your offerings, because you have not made seed in Israel. And Joachim was exceedingly grieved, and went away to the registers of the twelve tribes of the people, saying, I shall see the registers of the twelve tribes of Israel, as to whether I alone have not made seed in Israel. And he searched, and found that all the righteous had raised up seed in Israel. And he called to mind the patriarch Abraham, and in the last day God gave him a son Isaac. And Joachim was exceedingly grieved, and did not come to the presence of his wife. But he retired to the desert, and there pitched his tent, and fasted forty days and forty nights, saying in himself, I will not go down either for food or for drink, until the Lord my God shall look upon me, and prayer shall be my food and drink. And afterwards their prayers were heard, and God granted them a child, and what a child she was. So whether or not the curse of the bitter water rotting the unfaithful wife's flesh would have been a death sentence, at the very least it would have rendered infertile, and thus a curse among the people. All in all, far from a biblically approved abortion, the ordeal of bitter water was a practice completely in line with the Old Testament views and punishments concerning infidelity. (laughs) 